Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. And I hope that you're well. And I want to send very warm greetings from our home to yours and, and a sincere wish that, that you are keeping well under the circumstances, especially as we hear of uh, the fourth wave arriving, new variants. We've already had people in the congregation testing positive. And I do want to ask firstly that, that you exercise great care and, and that you also also exercise great prayer as, as we go into this next season. May God give us strength and grace. As we worship him together this morning, it's our great privilege to be able to, to know that we are united even though we can't be together. That, that God's Spirit draws us together. And if you can think of anyone that, that you would have normally sat with on a Sunday morning, if somebody in particular comes to mind, why not take a moment and drop them a message or give them a call? It's so important that we continue to reach out to one another and care for one another in these times. Just to say, as many of you know, Brenda's dad has not been well. He had to have a craniotomy 10 days ago, 12 days ago, and uh, he, he didn't wake up after the surgery. His condition is, is unpredictable at the moment, but we do ask for your ongoing prayers, and, and we want to thank you for the tremendous love and care that we've experienced from you as a congregation, and, and we value your love and your care. A great deal. Our call to worship is from Zechariah 4 verse 6. A very well known verse, but a very important one. And the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we begin our time of worship, we're very aware that our own strength is limited, our own might is limited, our own power is limited. And so we ask, brood over us, Holy Spirit, make your presence felt among us, be glorified in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Let's pray. Lord God of heaven and earth, we come to you this morning, offering to you our prayers of adoration and also our prayers of confession. And Lord, it's right that we begin by praise and with worship. When we consider your majesty, when we consider your greatness, we recognize, Lord, that you are the creator, sustainer, provider, and guide of our lives. But more than that, Lord, you became our savior, our redeemer, our rescuer, our deliverer. And then through the coming of your Holy Spirit, you became the one who transforms our lives, who shapes us to be more like Jesus, who encourages us and even gives us gifts of ministry that we may serve and work for you. And so, Father, we praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we glorify you and lift up our voices in your, in, in your adoration and in praise of you. But Lord, our, our adoration is cut short when we consider our own brokenness. And we confess, Lord, that the praises that we utter come from lips that have spoken angrily and kindly, jealously even. Lord, we've lacked compassion and grace and love. We've walked along pathways that are, are not wise, not good, and destructive to ourselves and others. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that through your blood shed on the cross, we may know forgiveness and that we are set free from our failures and our guilt and that by the power of your spirit, we may try again and know that we are not alone. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. share something with you that happened to me last week so something as you've probably guessed that I like to do is I like to buy a McDonald's or Burger King but mainly I like to get it from a drive-thru so I find that while I'm driving I just stop in at the drive-thru and I'll pick up a McDonald's meal and then I'll drive off and while I'm driving 
then I start eating it. So while I'm driving, I have the bag on the passenger seat next to me and I'm busy driving. You must imagine and I put my hand in and I feel around and I've got to try and guess and I pull out the serviette because you know, I'm, now I'm going to get messy. And then I feel around and then eventually I get the burger and I open it up and while I'm driving, I take out the burger and luckily I've got an automatic so I can eat the burger and then I stick my hand in again and I've got to feel around and I pull out my straw and I can open the straw and I can put it in the drink and I take a few sips and as I'm driving then and I pull out the chips and I put the chips here on my lap and I eat the chips and then I get to the end of the meal and I go, oh, I'm full but I could do with just a few more chips and this for me is the nicest part of any is when you put your hand back into the container and you can feel that there's a few chips that have fallen out. And then when you eat these chips, they just taste better than anything else you've actually eaten. And maybe you do the same when you get home. You fight with your brothers and sisters or argue with them about who gets to eat those few chips that's fallen out in the bag. But what all of this reminded me of last week was just how thankful and how gracious God is is that God gives us this full meal, this meal that we can eat and we can enjoy. It's what we need. But under His grace and His graciousness, He just goes that extra step. And He always gives us something a little bit more, something that tastes sweet. And that's something we can testify to through this hard time we faced. That God has been faithful. He's been so generous with us. He's given us more than what we need. And for that we are, can be so thankful for. And that's what people celebrated this last Thursday. Thanksgiving. The opportunity to celebrate the goodness of God. To express our thanks to Him. That He gives us more than what we actually need. So next time you're putting in at a McDonald's. And you're eating a meal or a happy meal with your parents. We can give thanks for God's goodness and God's generosity. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your generousness. Thank you that you give us more than what we need. Thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, that you meet our needs and you bless us with abundance. Thank you, Jesus, for your life. Thank you for the grace we have because of you. Thank you that we have more than what we need, that we can say along with David, our cup overflows. And thank you that we can use this to bless others too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our scripture reading this morning, we're going to be looking at a section of Romans chapter 8. I think Romans 8 is really one of the most significant passages in scripture. 
and it touches some incredibly important themes. I'm just going to overview the whole chapter with, with a couple of headings, and uh, I hope that encourages you to go and read the chapter for yourself and, and explore it for yourself. It starts off with the theme of justification, how Jesus took our guilt, paid for it on the cross. Then it moves to our sanctification, where it talks about how Jesus overcomes the inherent brokenness inside of us. And it solves the conundrum that Paul explained in, in Romans 7, where he says, The good that I want to do, I don't. And the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And here in chapter 8, Paul solves that when he talks about sanctification. How the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome our brokenness so that we can resemble Jesus. Then he moves on to the idea that, that we are adopted through the Holy Spirit, that we become sons and daughters of God. And, and he talks about how we enjoy the privilege of sonship. Now, when the passage is read and you see it talking about sonship there, it's not being chauvinist. Um, the reason that the translators have kept the idea of sonship rather than inheritance was that in Greco-Roman culture, sons, and especially firstborn sons, enjoyed a very special status. And, and the, the sonship that Paul is referring to here is that very special inheritance reserved for kind of the one that is most loved. And what Paul is saying is that we are all treated to this preferential inheritance, that, that we have the inheritance of a Greco-Roman son, that we are seen as first in God's eyes. Paul then goes on to talk about suffering, and he reminds us that suffering is temporary, but he acknowledges that suffering makes us groan. And he talks about how God gives us hope in the midst of suffering. He then moves on to prayer and shows us how that in the midst of our suffering, the Holy Spirit prays with us and for us. And then he moves to providence, where, show, where Paul shows us how God is at work in every part of our lives, that God works in all things for the good of those who love him. And then Paul ends the chapter with a roaring crescendo. And, and it's a crescendo that I start, that I bellow out at funeral services, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. The trouble and opposition may come, but through the love of the risen Savior, we are never alone and we will overcome. And so that's the chapter in a nutshell. But throughout the chapter, it's the Holy Spirit who is the unsung hero who makes all of this real in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit who, who Paul celebrates as the one who helps us to be sanctified, to be children of God, to overcome the suffering and groaning of the world, who teaches us to pray, who works in our circumstances and gives us victory. As we listen to our scripture reading, we're going to listen to the sections on adoption, on suffering, and on prayer. Listen carefully to this portion of this beautiful chapter from God's Word. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 28. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. 
for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this beautiful, rich and encouraging passage that we've listened to this morning. We pray that as we reflect on it, that we would bear it in mind and remember the lessons we have learned. Be with the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Isn't it just such a powerful image that Paul creates when he talks about groaning? A world that groans. People that groan. And God's Spirit who groans with us in prayer. And indeed, there is much to groan about. As we look around us, we see pain and sadness. As we look around us, we groan at the pointlessness of so many things. And even worse, as we look around us, we want to groan at the foolishness that, that seems to grip so much of humanity at this time. And worst of all, we groan at the brokenness that we see, the brokenness in human beings, the brokenness in creation. We groan as we wrestle with this world. And Paul depicts the Holy Spirit as a spirit who groans in prayer with you and me. And this morning, I want to talk a little bit about how does the groaning spirit help you and I and help the church when we suffer? How is it that we can experience the help of, of the groaning spirit in these challenging times? And as we look at the chapter, the chapter provides five ways in which God's spirit helps us in these groaning times. And we're going to work through them this morning. Firstly, God's Spirit makes us God's children, that we are children of the King, that we belong to Him and we are His. Secondly, the Spirit helps us to hope in the midst of suffering. Thirdly, the Spirit helps us to pray. Fourthly, the Spirit is at work in providence. And fifthly, the Spirit connects us to the resurrected or the crucified and resurrected Jesus and connects us to his conquering love. So let's dig in to these five points and just get a picture of, of the incredible care and support that God's Holy Spirit gives to you and me. So let's start with point number one, this idea that we are God's children through the Holy Spirit. And it's a beautiful thought that the Holy Spirit 
makes us not to live in fear and not to be slaves, but that we are adopted as sons and daughters and we are adopted into sonship. We're adopted into an identity and a purpose. We are adopted into intimacy. And Paul does an unusual thing here. In a letter to the Romans, he suddenly throws in an Aramaic phrase. And I'm sure some of his readers would have to inquire about this phrase that he throws in. Because he says, through the Spirit, we can cry out, Abba. And it's an Aramaic word. It's a word of intimacy and closeness. It means daddy or dad. It's, it's the phrase that, that a little child would use of, of, of daddy who's the hero. But in some ways also a teenager or a young man would use Abba as dad, as the one who is trusted, whose advice we can rely on, as one that we've learned will always be there for us. And Paul says through God's spirit, we get to relate to God as dad, as daddy, as Abba. That we experience this sense that we are the delighted in firstborn and, and we have the inheritance of the firstborn. That's the status that you and I have in God's presence. And it's the Holy Spirit who helps us to cry out, Abba, Father. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us that sense of belonging and intimacy. Secondly, God's Spirit helps us to have hope in suffering. You see, because we have an inheritance, when we face suffering, when, because we know that we have sonship in God, we know that our destiny is more than just this life. We know that there is a place for us with God. And so we can have hope in the midst of suffering. We know that our, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. And so hope can grow inside you and me because God's Spirit assures us that there is more to life than this life. And one of the things that, that has really excited me in the last while is that in the midst of all the brokenness, I keep on hearing people longing for, for justice, longing for, 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 for the scales to be balanced. And one of the things that C.S. Lewis said is that our longing for justice is evidence that heaven is real. Our longing for justice means that we are children of the king and we believe in the king's reign. We believe in justice. And while in our broken world we will never see perfect justice, there is a longing inside of us for something that will come. And so in the midst of our suffering, we have hope. We have a sense that God is at work and that this world is not an end in itself but is leading some way. But also through the Spirit, we experience the groaning of the world. And the world groans and we groan. And that groaning allows us to experience compassion. When we hear the world groan, we can run to its aid. When we hear others groan, we can run to comfort them. And when we ourselves groan, then we are able to identify with the pain and heartache of a world that is struggling. And God's Spirit helps us as we groan in the midst of suffering. And this leads us very naturally into the third point, And that is that in response to suffering, our instinctive response is to pray. However, very often it feels to us like our prayers hit the ceiling, like we don't have the vocabulary and the dialogue to express to God the enormity or the complexity of the pain that we're experiencing or seeing around us. And when this happens to us, we can know that God's Spirit will pray with us 
and alongside of us and and that he helps us in our weakness and and there's this beautiful picture that we have that that the holy spirit is praying for us 24 7 365 and a quarter days of every year that the holy spirit provides a stream of prayer and when we struggle to pray we can jump in to that stream of prayer and feel what God is doing and experience what God what is on God's heart and our prayers adjust and modulate and shift as we jump into the stream of prayer the fourth point that Paul makes and that's captured for us in in verse 28 he says God is at work through providence in all of our lives. Now, on the one hand, we believe that God is sovereign. But on the other hand, we also know that God makes space within his sovereignty for you and I to have free will. That means that we make choices that, that are contrary to God's plan and God's will. However, in his grace and mercy, God's providence is a little bit like the GPS in your car. You know, when you take a wrong turn, what does your GPS do? It says recalculating. And that's what God does in our lives, that he is constantly at work. And we don't have time this morning to dig into all the details of this significant topic. But in verse 29, which we didn't read this morning, Paul relentlessly explores how God is at work in our lives. And he talks about how God foreknew us, how God predestined us, how God calls us, how God justifies us, and how God glorifies us. And all of these verbs simply point out how God is thoroughly at work in you and me to accomplish his plan and perfect, that in all our circumstances, even the broken ones where either we have made a bad decision or somebody else's bad decision affects us, or the broken world affects us. Paul says, in all these circumstances, God is at work. And God transforms these circumstances for the good of those who love him. He's recalculating all the time. So that you and I will experience his best in the midst of of our pain and struggle. The final point that Paul makes about the Holy Spirit's work is captured for us in, in this section that, that I bellow out at the start of every funeral. And, and I don't literally bellow it, but in my heart and soul, when I read this passage, I'm bellowing because it's, it's such a great and significant and important truth. And when death bullies us, when, when pain bullies us, we need to know that we are connected to the crucified and resurrected Jesus and to his love. And his love will hold us and sustain us. And that in the midst of pain, in the midst of opposition, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. There is nothing and no one who can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And the one who helps us to experience this is none other than the groaning Holy Spirit. And so let me conclude. We serve an incredible God. Not only does he justify us, make us as though we've never sinned, not only does he sanctify us, in other words, change our hearts and, and, and take a heart of stone and turn it to a heart of flesh. But he adopts us as his children, that we can call him Abba, Father, Daddy. Then he steps into our suffering and helps us to dare to hope. He gives us a picture of a life beyond this life, of hope beyond these circumstances and this temporality and then he helps us to pray he helps us to pray when when our words run out 
and when we're overwhelmed and confused. And then he's at work in our circumstances, recalculating all the time so that we can experience his goodness and grace and love. And finally, he transforms our suffering by connecting us to the love of the resurrected Jesus. And we are more than conquerors. We will overcome. Now we often marvel that God would send his son into the world. And, and we marvel at the son who weeps at the heartache of the world. He weeps at Lazarus's grave and he weeps over broken Jerusalem. But you know what? That's just the beginning of God's generosity. Because God comes even closer to us when he not only sends his son into the world, but he sends his spirit into our hearts. And then he comes even closer to us because the spirit that he places in our hearts isn't there as some sort of judge and jury, as some sort of inner critique, but the spirit is inside of us and lives in us and prays in us and even groans with us. He even groans as we struggle in a broken and discouraged world. You and I, we forget so easily. You and I lose heart so easily. And we groan. But if we would take a moment to speak to our Father, we would find hope in the midst of suffering. We'd experience comfort in prayer. We would see God at work in our circumstances. And we will experience the relentless and unconquerable love of God. And we will overcome. Amen. While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, you are our provider of so many good and wonderful things. We are grateful every day for all the blessings you bestow on us. We pray that our tithes, as well as our time and our talents offered, may be pleasing and acceptable to you. Please use us and guide us to do your kingdom work here on earth. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that this morning we've been able to feast on your word. And that your word has given us such a rich and beautiful picture of the work of your spirit. Who makes us sons and daughters, who gives us hope in our suffering, who helps us to pray, who is at work in our circumstances and connects us to the relentless love of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross. And we thank you, Father, that you are the source and root of it all, that you are the God we can call daddy and lord we thank you for our blessings and for your providence in our lives but this morning our hearts are heavy as we think of our world and our country in the midst of yet another wave of the coronavirus the thoughts of a new variant as we look at at an economy that's battling and so many people that are so exhausted and worn at the, at, the, at the end of a busy year. And we would pray, Lord, be with us, help us. Spirit, groan with us and fill us with strength and courage. And we pray, Father, for those who are not well, who need your healing touch. We pray for those who are experiencing emotional and, and psychological stress and strain, for those who are utterly exhausted in body and mind, for those whose relationships are not healthy, for those who are worn and tired out, for those who feel like hope is running out, for our students and scholars writing exams, and for all those who feel that they just can't carry on. Lord, would you meet us and be with us and hold us and strengthen us. We offer our praise to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
it's been a great privilege to be with you this morning and, and an even greater privilege to break open this loaf of God's word, this beautiful passage from Romans. And I do pray that your heart and soul have been stirred and moved as, as we've contemplated God's word and, and contemplated this be- incredible truth that God's Holy Spirit is at work in us. And that if we would just quieten ourselves a little bit, we would hear his groanings. We would feel how he reassures us that we are sons and daughters of God. And how he would work in our lives to recalculate the things that happened to us so that God can be glorified in us and we can experience his unconquerable love. Before I close by pronouncing the benediction, I just want to share with you that next week is going to be a very special service. It's the first Sunday in December and it's a a communion service, but we're also turning it into a service of thanksgiving. And and in in the service of thanksgiving, we want to recognize that in spite of the hardships that we've been through in the last 18 months, In spite of the hardships that are on our doorsteps, God has provided for us. And as Craig reminded us through his children's address, God has been good to us. And he has blessed us with many good things. And then just as a a realistic acknowledgement of of the struggle and hardship too, we want to take a moment to, to remember those who have passed on, those who we have lost during this time. And we do so not out of a sense of crippling sadness or or morbidness, but rather that we want to pause and give thanks for their lives. And so there'll be a moment in which I'm going to uh, just, we'll have a prayer of thanksgiving and we'll put the names of of everybody that that we receive, um, we'll put their names up on screen and take a moment to give thanks for them. And so... I want to invite you, if you've lost a loved one this year, someone that you want to remember, someone that you want to give thanks for, then please send me a WhatsApp message. Give me the name and the surname of the person who has passed away and how you're connected to them. Um, and uh, and maybe just why you want to remember them in, in just a phrase or two. I won't be putting that on screen, but it might just be good for you to to express that. So send me the names of of those that you want to remember at this time. Also during the week, I'll be asking you for things that you are thankful for, uh, things that that you believe that God has blessed you with that have sustained you during this time. And let's count our blessings. And so this coming Sunday service will be a really special one. And I do hope you'll join us. And I do hope that you'll send me Firstly, something that you're thankful for. And secondly, the names uh, of of loved ones in particular that you want to remember. And and we'll include them in the service. As we go into this week, please be really responsible and careful. I know we're so tired of masks and we're dreading the, the family meeting that tells us that we're moving to a different lockdown level. We're frustrated at the restrictions, but the, the bit of reading that I've done tell me that that we need to take this fourth wave seriously and to be as responsible as we possibly can. And instead of moaning and groaning, let's offer hope. Let's offer encouragement. Let's tackle this with a positive attitude. Let's let the Spirit help us to transform this challenging time. And so... Look after yourselves. God be with you and God bless you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the presence of the Spirit, the beautiful Holy Spirit that we've talked about this morning, may He hold us and be with us, now and forevermore. Amen.
For Pretoria North, we have Ufense, who is celebrating his birthday today, Sunday the 28th. Happy birthday. And here are the birthdays and anniversaries for Grace and Emmanuel. On Sunday, today, it's Bob's birthday. Then on Monday, Liam will turn 15, Jethro 10, and Natalie and Trixie will celebrate their birthdays as well. Tuesday, Elizabeth and Liam, who turns 5. Thursday, Yanni and Lizanne. Friday, Angela, Amy and William. And on Saturday, Ansa. We have the following anniversaries. On Monday, Inna and Mark and Sarah and Graham. On Thursday, Portia and Boyce. On Friday, Debbie and Leon and Priscilla and Fidelis. And on Saturday, Sonia and Mark. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for special people and special days in our lives. Bless these people celebrating their birthdays and anniversaries this week. Draw them close to you and guide them throughout the coming year. Amen. <laughs> 